According to new theological dicta, William Burr would reside amongst the bestial classes, while his love of the bottle would, according to Spurzheim, accord him with an inordinately enlarged organ of alimentiveness. Satire aside, the case of Bergen Hare suggests, as Luke Gibbons argues, that craniology and skull shape, phrenology and physiognomy became the province of the new scientific racism promoted by the Enlightenment. In sum, Gibbon's argument is this, that from the 16th century, the Irish were condemned as much for their degenerate savagery as for their popish superstitions, and that along with Highlander, these primitive societies haunted the imagination of civilised society as rebarbative and recidivist adversaries, threatening to corrode society from within. The Celts, according to Gibbons, were a source of pollution in the body politic. Their priest-maddened wolfish spirits at once contagious and incurable. The wolfishness of the Irish was not, for some comparative physiognomists, confined to their spirits, but evident in their appearance and character traits of what James W. Redfield described as these curs of low degree. He continued, Compare the Irishman and the dog. In respect to barking, snarling, howling, begging, fawning, flattering, backbiting, quarrelling, blustering, square, scenting, seizing, hanging on, teasing, rollicking, and whatever traits you may discover in either, you will be convinced there is a wonderful resemblance. And you can see the glorious resemblance here between the Irishman and the dog. And we have some images there from uh, Charles Le Brun, who also did this comparative Physiognomy. If anybody wants to have a chat with me afterwards and tell me where they come from, I can actually tell you which animal we're supposed to correspond with. Um, the animal I correspond with is about to come up. Mitigating the vicious canine behaviour of Irish women, whom the author admires as resembling King Charles Spaniels in their long flowing hair, large sympathetic eyes and biddable natures. <laughs> This placidity is not, however, endemic to the race, as he warns that a snappish, beslavering Irishman has a taste for the vinous fermentation which leads to putrefactive, during which times he himself is the monster that is to be dreaded. May I just say it is St. Patrick's Day, so you may take this on board. And will Curlite bite the English hand that feeds him? Bloody Irishman is a name applicable to the Irish in general, in general, warns Mr. Renfield. And kill is a word attached to half the places in Ireland. Kildare, Killarney, Kilkenny, Kilkerney, etc. However, with the correct stern training, as befitting a dog, he will become a faithful servant, who will say, go on, master, I will follow you to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. Thus, in accord with 19th century stereotypes, the Irish are depicted as naturally aggressive, untrustworthy and vicious, but capable of servility if harshly handled and correctly trained. William Burke, though not from a town with the prefix kill, was a murderer. However, what is truly remarkable about uh, contemporary descriptions of him is the unremarkable nature of his appearance in every aspect other than its phrenological, uh, phenotypical Irishness. For example, the Caledonian Mercury of uh, Thursday, 25th of December, 1828, recounts, the male prisoner, as his name indicates, is a native of Ireland. He is a man rather below middle size and stoutly made, and of a determined, though not particularly sinister, expression or countenance. The contour of his face, as well as his features, is decidedly Milesian. It is round with high cheekbones, grey eyes, a good deal sunk in the head, a short, snubbish nose and a round chin, but altogether of a small cast. He has upon the whole what we call in this country a whoff, rather than a ferocious appearance. Though there is a hardness about the features mixed with an expression in the grey twinkling eyes, that is far from inviting. Actually, that's not entirely true. There was always a welcome in the parlour by Burke and Hare for anybody who wanted to go in there. Shortly afterwards, they were only too happy to roll out the barrel to the uh, anatomist. Or... The editorial, which juxtaposes the ethnocentric rhetoric of phrenology without a physiognomy, implies that Burke's countenance, though not overtly ghoulish or villainous, displays hints of an inner deviant character, which is decidedly Milesian. 
For decidedly Milesian, read decidedly Irish, as an article in Blackwoods of the following year observes. Unfortunately, the domination of the Celt over Irish character is modified chiefly by that of the Milesian, whose large and dark eye, high and sharp nose, thin lips and linear mouth declares his southern origin, much more surely than Irish history or Irish fable. Notably, the appearance of the Milesian reflects a uh, pseudonymous, volatile, melanic temperament. Actually, Milesian temperaments are known, for those of you who, who are of a darker head hue, as brunette temperaments. Um, blonde temperaments are apparently much more biddable, much pleasanter, much nicer people. Those of us who are brunettes, apparently, we have a kind of propensity to be wild and, 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 and misbehave. Notably, the appearance of the Milesian reflects his pseudogenic uh, melanic temperament, which the article suggests has a love of splendour, a want of taste, voluptuousness and licence. This characterises the brunette temperament, unchecked. When combined with the imagination and passion of the Aboriginal population of Ireland, this leads to a people deficient in reason deficient in judgment, who according to the writer must naturally be less distinguished in the discrimination of good and ill and the calm and patient uh, discharge of duty than in the love of friends and the hatred of foes, or in the devotion even unto death to any cause which they may espouse. So the Milesi and Irish are distinguished by their irrationality, their fanaticism and their in inability to distinguish between good and evil. This is William Burke. He's not looking too hot there. He'd just been hanged. So, <laughs> and had a death mask made. The kind of, if those ghoulish ones are on, you can actually see the line of the rope around his neck. It comes up much more closely after. Not less obvious, the article argues, how utterly worthless and contemptible must seem Irish want of judgment, want of principle, and want of industry, and how well deserved Irish wretchedness, though it is to be feared that the inevitable effect of this contempt is less salutary than for the sake of Ireland one would wish it to be. So the term Milesian, equally the term Irish, can be seen as an abusive epithet, indicating the non-rational propensities of the bearer. It's a racial stigmata. In the Mercury's article, however, these fa facial features are specifically associated through phrenological and physiognomic discourse with criminality. The sunken eyes and the snub nose indicate ferocity, vanity and villainy. Burke's singularly uninviting expression is described as wolf, which in Old Scottish is freakish or startling. And yet in comparison with descriptions of other criminals at the time, what is most surprising is that the source of Burke's evil is not immediately evident in his face. Take, for example, a description of Mary Andrew, the leader of a gang of professional resurrectionists who stalked the West Port, the west part of Edinburgh, at the same time as Burke and Hare, and were making a killing, sorry, you can all howl at this, out of corpses in Edinburgh at the time. In Andrew Layton's The Court of Carcass, Mary Andrew is described as of gigantic height, thin and gaunt, even to ridiculousness, with a long pale face and the jaws of an ogre. This grotesque description verges on the occult in its description of the abnormal, abnormal size and prognathous jaws of the body snatcher. Compare this to an article written in May 1829 by the Blackwoods <coughs> berserker Christopher North, in which he argues that incongruously his first impression of William Burke was that there was nothing repulsive about him. And he felt the criminal was intended by nature for a good dancing master, excelling in the Irish jig. Burke, according to North, was a good specimen of the Irish character, not quarrelsome, expert with a spade, and a pleasant enough companion over a jug of toddy. Thus, in comparison to the monstrous Mary Andrew, Burke appears to North to be stereotypically inebriate, industrious, and entertaining paddy. While Mary Andrew exemplifies the Aristotelian assumptions that the body and soul are in accord and reflect one another, William Burke appears to refute this, and with its basic premises of phrenology and physiognomy. Um, on closer inspection, however, the graphic pen of North paints a monster lurking beneath the Irishman's uncannily normal appearance. 
He was impenitent as a snake, remorseless as a tiger. I studied in his cell his hard, cruel eyes, his hardened lips, which truth never touched, not, nor moved from their cunning compression. His voice rather soft and calm, but steeped in hypocrisy and deceit, his collected and guarded demeanour, full of danger and guile, all, all betrayed as he lay in his shackles, the cool, calculating, callous, lovely bit of alliteration there, of course, one would expect that from Kit North, and unrelenting villain. The image produced is bestial and atavistic, stressing Burke's cunning, his hypocrisy, his deceit, combined with his observable lack of remorse and impenitence. This displays not only his evident culpability, but also capacity for deliberate and intentional evil. In the absence of clear somatic indicators, Burke's diabolical depravity is defined as part of his essence, of his soul, and becomes more sinister because it is cunningly concealed by his cold and calculated manner. However, his inner monstrosity manifests itself in his facial expressions, which mark him, in the eyes of North, as an unrelenting villain. Conversely, Burke's compatriot and partner in crime, William Hare, has the observable physiognomic and phrenological attributes, which mark him immediately as an evolutionary throwback and a genetic criminal. He was, as North recalls, the most brutal man ever subjected to my sight, and at first looked seemingly like an idiot. His dull, dead, blackish eyes wide apart, one rather higher up than the other, his large, thick, or rather coarse-lipped mouth, his high, broad cheekbones and sunken cheeks, each of which were, when he laughed, which he did often, collapsed into a perpendicular hollow, shooting up ghastly from chin to cheekbones all steeped in a sullen and squalor not born of the jail, but native to the almost deformed face of the leering miscreant, inspired not fear, for the aspect was scarcely ferocious, but disgust and abhorrence. So utterly loathsome was the whole look of the reptile. North's observations, though doubtlessly satirical, reflect popular conceptions of physiognomy and phrenology. And from these, he interprets Hare as a hereditary delinquent, ugly, degenerate and extremist, biologically predetermined to be evil. Unlike Burke, Hare's repulsive physiognomy accurately represents his inner evil, yet his apparent idiocy, indicated by the dead eyes and grotesque grimacing, mitigates his monstrosity and marks him as the lesser of two evils set against the cold, calculating Burke. One might speculate that this, along with his turning of King's evidence, resulted in the former escaping the gallows, while the latter was hanged, gibbeted, anatomised and dissected, taken in death by the profession he had so nefariously served in life. <laughs>